You shouldn't have told that reporter Gdansky, Walker. No! I never spoke to her! Honest, Grizz! See, I got a big gun here, and usually when I point it at folk, they get real open to suggestion real quick. Is that so? Guess I'll have to shoot you then. Urban Chaos is an unhinged PS1 game, and it's mostly a nightmare to play, however, it is impressive in a few ways. You play as a rookie cop in a city that's gone to hell, the millennium is coming, and oh boy, the year 2000 is gonna be spooky, I guess. Crime rates are soaring, which means it's up to you to brutally murder, or arrest if you're feeling generous, all the criminals and gang members that supposedly run this town, who all wear green so you can spot them, of course. The gameplay is broken up into 20 or so missions, but once you're in them, unless there's a time limit of some kind, it's basically an open world. This is one of a few reasons this game is impressive. It released in late 1999 or early 2000, meaning at least a year and a half before Grand Theft Auto 3. GTA 3 was hugely influential to the industry, and here's this little garbage game a year before doing its own version of a third-person pedestrian slayer. Don't believe me? You can drive in this game, and it lets you run down any enemy or civilian you come across. While the Grand Theft Auto games of the time looked like this, Urban Chaos managed to pull this off. As much credit as it deserves, it's also completely whack. From start to finish, you'll be wrestling with the controls and the camera, dealing with the god-awful targeting system and jank combat mechanics, and subjected to batshit off-the-wall dialogue. You might even find yourself unknowingly leading the charge in some eerily true-to-life police brutality sessions. This is a ridiculous, borderline insane game that maybe should be forgotten, but not yet. Not today. I'm gonna... talk about it in depth. We'll do this in a classic review style and go with the visuals and audio design first. The game itself looks mostly awful, and even people in the year 2000 thought so. At the same time, though, the faces and character models aren't atrocious or anything, and the attention to detail in this mostly open world is great to see. The leaves, newspaper clippings, and other debris flying here and there helps this stilted and low-poly game world feel a little more atmospheric. Garbage bins, when bumped into, drop trash, such as empty cans, which bounce around if you walk or run over them. Same goes for a few other objects, such as orange cones. The cars driving around, either stopping for you or running you down, in addition to the NPCs who walk around the city minding their own business, who you can even talk to, make the city feel a bit more real, like you're not the only thing that has agency in this town. The blood from defeated enemies on the ground, and even the soaked footsteps of your character when she's hurt, are also details that help show your impact on this world. The bodies disappearing so quickly is sometimes jarring, but what can you do? There aren't many interiors you can walk into, but the few that are in the game are made better, given that you can walk in and out without obvious transitions or load times. I'm sure this wasn't terribly difficult, considering it's such a small sectioned off room, but still, not bad. All those positives said, what really dampens the experience is how the level design mixes with the awful draw distance. Absolutely, they deserve props for pulling a GTA 3 adjacent open world off with weaker hardware at their disposal, and likely a smaller team and budget. But oh god, this map is so painstakingly grueling to explore. There's no overhead map for reference, and everything that isn't rendered yet just isn't there. Not a lower quality image to give you the impression that you'll run into a building in 50 feet, no, just the horizon. Poor draw distances are a product of the time on the PS1, sure, but in Urban Chaos it feels a lot worse since the levels are so large and non-linear, and the game doesn't do much to work around the problem. For example, in Tenchu, this issue exists as well, but it definitely feels like the designers tuned the game to match the limitations. You're given a distance indicator at the bottom left, showing you how close you are to enemies, 0 being far away, 100 being on top of them. Plus, their AI is pretty bad, it takes a couple seconds for them to actually spot you, which gives you a chance to back off. In Urban Chaos, you're given a GPS, but because oftentimes the goal requires you to first get to a colored dot, this low-information radar only amplifies the problem. Many areas which your GPS directs you to can only be reached through a series of specific ladder climbs and jumps, 
or simply a single gap in the never-ending sprawl of buildings locking you in. This gels poorly with the timed missions, as even when you employ the cornfield strat, where you glue yourself to one side of the path, you might keep running until the time runs out, thinking, surely the gap I'm looking for is right at the edge of the draw distance limitation, right? The forced verticality, when there isn't a timer, isn't all that bad, and goes some way in scratching the itch of freeform exploration that I really enjoy. I'll touch on that in more detail later. The cutscenes have their own share of problems, most notably the fixed camera shots that don't always show your character in them. If you aren't standing in the exact spot the game predicted you would, when Darcy speaks, it just shows a camera view of nothing. work to be doing. Officer Bellows? Who put you on this? Except it can also happen to the person you're supposedly talking to as well. Get back! You think I'm gonna let you lock me down again? I'll kill you, cop! That's supposed to scare me? I think I'm gonna have to bust your head, boy. And at times, the text will be next to the wrong person's picture, making it seem like the other person is talking. Officer Byrne, were you talking to the suspect earlier today? Uh, yes, yeah, Stern. He was helping me out with the case, uh, as an informant, you know. That's all you got to say, huh? Boy, this game isn't very good. You're able to skip dialogue, which is great considering how often you'll have to restart later levels, but the way the game shoots you straight into a cutscene when playing almost assures that you'll skip some by accident. So often I'd be in combat, pressing the attack button or what have you, only for a random cutscene to begin, and the first line of text to be on screen for only a split second. Hmm, just as blunt as your father, I see. Even worse for the scenes that only have a single camera shot and one bit of dialogue, since those get skipped entirely. Well, if it ain't Rookie Stern, just awful stuff. Advancing through cutscenes should not be the same button you use to attack enemies. The menus were a bit hit or miss. The rain effect was cool, which eventually turned into snow for one level, but the mission select screen isn't all that clear. Not much information is given to you when hovering over locations and places, just the level name, which isn't all that helpful, and the pins are scattered all around the map. There's not much order to it. Thankfully, the game defaults to the next unlocked mission each time, so as long as you're just trying to play the full game once through, it's not the worst. The text itself also caught my eye, specifically for the saving and loading. I don't know, something about how it just says OK after it saves and loads is great. It's almost passive-aggressive. The text on the mission briefing is also funny, but mostly with how it relates to the voiceover. The voice acting itself is pretty mediocre, which is the standard of the time, but this is different. I get them reading the entire briefing to you, but they also robotically recite the objectives as well, which sounds incredibly goofy. We also got a mugging team working the area, and we need at least one of those guys caught. That's all. Bring the car back to the district station. Arrest at least one mugger. So you've got to shut this security system down before making your attempt. Shut down alarm systems. Arrest Bay. Oh, we also got a call from your snitch, Deeks. Says he wants to meet you to pass on some, uh, personal info. Hell if I know what he means. Meet Deeks. There's some music in the game during a few select missions, but the balancing is completely out of whack. In the nightclub, it just completely shuts off the music when the characters begin talking. Hey there, fella. Guy called Georgie said I'd find Wild Bill in here. Oh, the Wildcats got everyone here worried. Nobody jumps unless they say so. The final level is the only time where there's background music throughout, and they blast it at such a high volume it drowns out everything else. Besides this level, and the nightclub I guess, the music only triggers during specific circumstances. When you're driving or sprinting, it kicks in, and also after the first few seconds of an enemy confrontation. Since many enemies attack you one at a time, and you can flip them over and arrest them lickety-split, it always sounds off how quickly it ramps up, then fades out after a second or two. You're under arrest. You'll likely be jogging around the open world maps, so it's kind of jarring to hear the music introduce itself, only to vanish the moment you slow down to turn, or to tackle yet another approaching enemy. This means more often than not, you're left with near total silence as you wander around the city. Not to worry though, as there's a couple jingles and other audio cues that chime in now and then which fill the void, and genuinely, they've begun to haunt me when not playing. 
this sound specifically. Keeps me up at night. It's all I can hear in my head as I lay in bed. The sound supposedly signifies that an enemy is entering your GPS radius, but clearly something went wrong here. The distance away from Darcy where the sound triggers isn't the maximum radius of the GPS. It's even further... Meaning you'll hear this sound... ad nauseum... When it doesn't even matter, the game just does it to taunt you. It can even trigger in cutscenes. Here's an example of it happening, all the while Darcy is standing at a weird angle for some reason. Thanks, Roper. Looks like I owe you my life again. This game is nuts. There's a few other sounds, but try as I might, I can't pin down what they're meant to tell me. One is a heart monitor and a thumping, and I honestly have no idea what it relates to. I've seen it used a couple times when I died, which makes sense. But it shows up all the freaking time! It's not for when I shoot and kill an enemy, it's not for when I get shot and take damage, and sometimes it plays when nothing is happening! Is it warning me of the nearby enemy's aim? That I'm in range? No idea, absolutely none. There's one more audio cue that mostly makes sense. It sounds like low keys on a piano. I'm fairly sure this is meant to convey that an enemy has seen me, and their red dot on the GPS will turn into a blinking red and white dot. Except this one isn't consistent either. It's sometimes played when no enemies near me could see me. Maybe the wall was blocking their vision and this is dictated by distance? I don't know, but I'm so tired of these goddamn noises. The gunfire all sounds fine, as well as the explosions. Not much of note there, but the pickups themselves are pretty embarrassing. The visuals and audio don't lift a finger when trying to convey that you've grabbed them, they just disappear. Stop pulling! I recently played Metal Gear Solid on the PS1, and one of my favorite things to do was search for extra supplies. It wasn't solely because more ammo and equipment helped me stay alive. The simple act of walking over pickups was satisfying all on its own. There's some nice text that pops up, and a little echoey click sound attached to it, which was always a delight to hear. It was perfectly clear what you grabbed, when it went into your inventory, and how much of it you were given. The controls in MGS are much better than in Urban Chaos 100%, but ignoring that, even though it's functionally the same thing, grabbing an item on the ground and it disappearing into your inventory, Urban Chaos's rendition of this simple act is so lifeless and boring by comparison. I know it's a small detail to complain about, but it really does dampen the enjoyment of collecting your spoils. It was already awkward to angle yourself in the proper position to clumsily walk into the dang items in the first place, many times your character's model clearly coming in contact with the gun or ammo but it not registering, but with no visual or audio flair when acquiring the items, it just made the game feel low budget and unresponsive. There's also a glaring lack of non-diegetic sound for cycling through weapons in your menu, it's just blank. For a well-rounded example of the poor quality and utter insanity that is Urban Chaos, I'll just let this next clip play out in full. Don't leave my boy alone, lady! I'll bust your ass if you touch him! If he's in the Wildcats, I need to talk to him. You're dead, Hag! You're under arrest. Don't you touch my boy! The voice acting is really the star of the show for Urban Chaos's sound design. 
Going along with how ridiculous it is that most of the bad guys wear the same green outfits, it sounds like the Wildcat gang fall into two camps for their voices. Either a smarmy, high-pitched version... Didn't nobody tell you, cop freak? You sinners ain't allowed around here no more. The reign of the UCPD is at an end, cop! Wildcats control Union City now! Or a Jamaican accent version... Hey, we told you cops to stay the hell out of our patch. Now you can join our celebrations. <laughs> Wildcats got this area covered, cop. Time to die. When you focus in on the dialogue itself, it becomes apparent how unhinged this game is. It is cool that the main character is a woman, especially for the time, that wasn't super common. However, it almost feels like an excuse for the bad guys to say whore a hundred times. I hear we got some cop whore on our tail. You dead whore! One written in cold steel, whore! Foul whore of Union City! Brothers, it's that cop whore Stern that Braddock talked about! Think that's funny, huh? You wait, whore! I'm coming to finish your ass! I think the word choice is out of line, of course, but honestly, I'm not here to defend Darcy. She's a fucking Howdy, Stern. Chief tells me you're the department's genuine super rookie. You trying to be funny, Green? How is it possible to be funny with a face as messed up ugly as yours? Shit, Darcy, I was only... Shut it. If you can keep up with me, you'll live. If you can't, you'll die. Clear? Well, okay, Stern. I was just messing around. Sheesh. Fooling around will get you killed, Green. Now let's go. Pretty absurd, right? She's a rookie, he's been a cop longer than her, is acting innocent and playful, and she calls him ugly and tells him to shut it. God damn, what an asshole. The worst was when a supposed sex worker asked for help as someone was stalking her. Just watch for yourself. Officer, there's a man following me! I think he's a stalker! Are you sure he's not just a customer, miss? Hell no! The guy's a nut! He's... Oh no! There he is! This game is fucking unhinged, man. If you're wondering why I didn't step in to save her, I definitely tried. The controls for Urban Chaos are truly terrible. Funny enough, the guides I glanced at for Urban Chaos, all four of them, have the same thing in common. They're all unfinished. Even better, two of the four mostly trash the game. One even has a list of reasons not to play it. Amazing. The IGN one looked to be the most complete of the four, but was definitely missing late game missions for some reason. I can't say I blame the creators of any of these guides, as this is one of the clunkiest and disgusting games I've played in quite a while. There's two ways to play, either with the analog button turned on and using the left stick, or with it turned off and using the D-pad. I tried both, but the D-pad felt easier to control in a pinch. That's not saying much, honestly. So often was I battling for my life, the main enemy being the controller. I have no issues with tank controls. I'd say I'm in the minority of gamers that can easily get used to and even appreciate them. Ten shoes specifically, I really loved after I got the hang of them. The main problems with Urban Chaos's controls stem from the camera not following behind your back at all times, and the complete shift in Darcy's movement when forcibly locked onto an enemy. If turning left or right by pressing the corresponding D-pad input also moved the camera in a one-to-one -one fashion, it would be so much easier to understand what's going on when angling yourself for a jump or attempting to fire at a nearby enemy. Instead, you'll either have to press L2 or R2 to shift the camera over slightly, or go into first-person mode with L1 to correct it manually. The former doesn't always work, especially in tight spaces, is a set distance, and feels awkward on the whole. The latter can help when aiming at enemies below you, but for general purposes, isn't as speedy of a process as it needs to be when in life or death situations. Both in MGS1 and Tenchu, the first-person viewpoint is more advantageous and easier to utilize. When you're panicking near a group of enemies, neither of the two camera tricks I mentioned are ideal, so you may end up trying to run forward until the camera finally corrects itself, or praying to the gods whoever it is you're targeting is an enemy and not a bystander. The targeting system is automatic. If Darcy is close enough to, well, anyone or anything while holding a gun, and you're kind of looking that way, the green arrows will latch on to the enemy, pedestrian, oil barrel, car, and what have you. I sometimes opted to walk around barehanded since I was so tired of Darcy holding up civilians at gunpoint without my consent. 
There was almost a workaround to the camera issues when targeting enemies, as Darcy shouts orders at them when the lock-on aims at someone, meaning you'd have a decent audio cue to work off of. When you hear her yell, freeze, you know it isn't a car or a barrel. Freeze! Except there's a gigantic roadblock to this. Enemies and friendlies don't get their own distinct audio cue. Freeze! Freeze! freeze or stop, stop police could mean you're aiming at the enemy about to shoot you in the face with a shotgun, stop, freeze! or you're about to murder an innocent civilian. With how low your maximum health is in the game, and how infrequent you find healing pickups, taking out enemies that are targeting you is of the utmost importance, and time is of the essence. If you don't immediately start blasting to stunlock gun-wielding enemies, you'll likely take damage, meaning you don't always have the time to make sure the line of fire is clear and you have the right target. A huge hassle under normal circumstances, but when hostages get intermixed, it's unfucking bearable We're not there yet, though. Targeting an enemy doesn't always consist of the green arrows landing on them and you firing your gun. There's a second, invisible lock-on system. If you're close enough to an enemy, or you begin punching a human of any kind, Darcy loses her normal movement and automatically locks onto that person. Left and right don't turn left and right like the normal tank controls, they strafe. You can't run away, the circle button no longer lets you sprint. You can't even run towards the enemy to close the distance to perform a slide tackle. She meanders her way over like it's a boxing match. Not the best idea when a dude is aiming a shotgun at your face. There's no real tell for when this invisible melee range lock-on starts. Darcy will just randomly get into a fighting pose, and you're then unable to play the game normally. Your only solution for escape is to barrel roll back to your home planet, Dark Souls dodging until you're far enough from the enemies so she can move freely again. Truly dog shit, just awful stuff. Whether you're trying to avoid confrontation or in the middle of a necessary handicap match, the controls, targeting, and camera will constantly get in your way. This mission in particular, Transmission Terminated, was a nightmare, and here is where the hostage nonsense comes into play. So many issues combine together here to create a situation that is almost unfair. I'll list them all out so you can see what I'm talking about. Issue number one, when entering a new room or building, it flips the camera so it faces Darcy's front for some reason, so you won't be able to see anything until you swing it back around. Issue number two, health is always in short supply. Enemies seem to drop health pickups at random, and the probability seems awfully low. Not only that, you can't save healing items for later, either you take it there or you leave it. As a side note, you have to manually grab the pickup if it will heal less than 50, it seems, which is, I don't know, kind of a choice, I guess, but simply leaving it in that spot for later, in this quasi-open-world setting, certainly isn't as ideal as letting you carry it as a healing item. Issue number three. Missions are long, and there are no checkpoints. When you die or fail the level, you have to start over. With all the control and camera issues, plus the lack of plentiful healing items, the long missions make it hard to stay alive, so killing enemies as fast as possible before they get a chance to remove a chunk of your health bar is imperative. This is amplified to the umpteenth degree when the suit-wearing alien people are thrown in, as they shoot chain gun things and can essentially wipe out your entire health pool in quick fashion. Those guys need to be hyper-focused on, gun down ASAP without hesitation, otherwise you're toast. Issue number four, the draw distance and radar don't mesh well together, so you might find yourself baiting out enemy forces one at a time by inching forward, especially when enemies start wielding assault rifles and your health is low. Add on that you can target enemies that aren't fully rendered yet, and those invisible enemies can do the same to you. Issue number five, like I've mentioned, Darcy's audio cue for aiming a gun at someone is the same regardless if they're a hostile or not. Finally, issue number six, the final nail in the coffin for this particular encounter. The hostages, who if you kill by accident fail the entire mission, also wear green. Remember what I said earlier, all bad guys wear green? Yeah, these hostages do too. Darcy screams, stop police, and I'm shitting my pants thinking I'm now face to face with the suit-wearing alien mafia guys who can end my life in under two seconds, or at the very least a shotgun-wielding green wildcat, but no, a hostage, and now I have to spend another 20 minutes playing this mission all over again. Stop! Police! A hostage has been killed. These six issues, some of them relatively minor and others foundational, combined together to create such a toxic mess of a level. 
Oh, by the way, the first time I played this, I managed to slide by the opening room, but the game froze when I went upstairs. Amazing. Who knows if this was a disc problem or a game problem, but I will say, this was the only time Urban Chaos froze on me, and in many other instances, strange glitches and bugs were hard to miss. Oh, I'm grabbing this dude. Well, there he goes. Oh goody, this enemy landed on top of me. I can't hit him. He's still floating even though I'm clearly not under him anymore. He can aim and shoot at me, and I'm dead. This guy gets caught trying to slide down a rope. There were plenty others that relate to the NPC pathfinding like this, but I don't feel like hunting for them again, so just take my word for it. I also noticed, like, all the time, NPCs' heads, arms, or whatever combination of their body would be cut off or missing. Maybe an unfair criticism, and this is simply the limitations of the PS1 hardware when pushing 3D models and terrain so hard, but still, it was hard to ignore. You can drive in the game, and even though it controls like shit and it's mostly unnecessary for the majority of playtime, it's still incredibly impressive for the time. The manual for the game embellishes quite a lot in many areas. For example, it hypes up its stealth and supposed enemy guard routes, saying any trace, such as sound and even blood trails, could be detected by patrolling enemies. Like many things with this game, that sounds awfully ambitious, but I never got the impression that any of that was genuinely happening, personally. That said, the manual did teach me about commandeering vehicles, which works exactly as described. Kind of hard to believe they got this to work so seamlessly, it's pretty cool. For parked vehicles, it's a bit underwhelming. So many are off limits, even cop cars, and in a world where I can murder pedestrians, after I tell them to get on the ground of course, it's kind of nuts that I can't break someone's window or something. Pressing circle near a vehicle will far more often result in the game saying it's locked. The circle button and the actions tied to it deserve a section all to itself. It's the action button, sprint button, and the crouch button. The latter being a priority for some ungodly reason, so whether you're trying to inch your way to a ladder to climb down safely, press a switch, handcuff someone, search a body, or perhaps even grab a nearby item, you'll likely crouch instead of the thing you wanted to do. This wouldn't be bad in and of itself, but crouching is basically useless. There's almost never a reason to sneak up on average bad guys, as one takedown will let you arrest them immediately, and they almost always spot you beforehand anyway, but even still, you don't need to approach them prone to do a stealthy one-hit knockout. There's even an early mission with a suicidal jumper where you're clearly told to sneak up on the guy. There's dialogue saying it essentially verbatim. As soon as he sees anybody, huh? Guess I'll have to take the quiet approach. Sweet, this sounds fun and different. Except a cutscene starts when I run up to him, and just like that, the objective is completed. Oh, how fun. But I want to be a fireman! The only time this prone position comes in handy is when you're in very specific missions which have laser wire explosives to avoid, but even here the game is a clunky mess. Holding circle while not moving, then walking forward, should cause her to crawl on the ground, but it obviously doesn't work like it should, as I run into the wire for some reason. It doesn't even phase me here, but in another attempt, it killed me after a small delay. This game, man. Even more, you can easily jump over these wires, so even when you're given the opportunity to take advantage of this prone state, it's still better not to. A completely useless mechanic, and it takes precedence over other, more important, and more often used functions. Great. All that said, some of the other actions the circle button presides over aren't handled well either. The investigation mechanic is at best harmlessly superfluous, and at worst completely stupid. I can kind of understand holding circle to search the people you've arrested, but at first blush, it sounds more interesting than it really is. I figured it would be adjacent to true crime streets of LA, where you can randomly search people and maybe find drugs or what have you. No, arresting an enemy is functionally the same as murdering them, and you won't find anything that incriminates them or anything, if you're lucky it's health packs or ammo. Far more often you'll find nothing, in fact, I'd say 80% of the time you find nothing, 10% of the time it's equivalent to what they already dropped when initially arrested or murdered, and the other 10% is something good. The search takes too long, isn't paired with any animation to justify its length, and rarely results in anything worthwhile being found. Even stranger is that when enemies disappear, they sometimes leave an item that wasn't there previously. Is this what you would have gotten if you had searched them? Some bodies stay there for a while, and others disappear right away, so it's just... such a crapshoot. 
In its current form, searching bodies serves as a sometimes necessary annoyance, an extra step you're forced into when you're scrounging for more health and ammo in tough and or long levels. Even more baffling, though, is that in one mission, you can investigate a dumpster to find a secret objective MacGuffin. You can complete this level without doing it, the copper guy will say you could have searched harder or something, so this is optional, but it just makes no sense to me why these dumpsters can be searched when nothing else, basically in the entire game, can. You aren't even told to explicitly investigate the dumpsters, the little cutscene shows the couches and TV, and in my opinion, there's not a logical step from use the action I searched dead bodies with to search dumpsters. You can't even search dumpsters anywhere else either. I only found this out by seeing someone else do it randomly in a long play of the game. Add on the fact that the dialogue doesn't change with the officer afterwards? Darcy just says the same thing? I don't know, man. No idea. Like I mentioned, you can press circle near a downed, well, anyone, and arrest them, making them a non-threat if they were hostile. Besides the exceptions where you get whacked with a bat and die, <clears throat> uh, the other enemies will mostly just stop and watch as you do this, funny enough, and because flipping them just requires you to press square while walking forward, it's a fairly overpowered and boring strategy, all things considered. After a while, you play as a different character, Roper, who can't sprint or arrest anyone since he's not a real police officer. Even still, flipping them and stomping away works like a charm. The flip into arrest combo being so strong makes the kick action mostly useless on the whole. Even worse, since it takes up an entire button, triangle, which is used exclusively for kicking and sliding. While running and sprinting, you can slide into people and arrest them right away. The enemies can perform it on you as well, though, which can feel infuriating at times. The slide technique is also a pretty overpowered maneuver, and between this and the flip arrest, there's not much reason to use anything else. Except guns, of course. An annoying quibble about the flip into arrest combo, if they had a weapon and dropped it, you might grab the item instead of arresting them. For some reason when this happens, the enemy stands up immediately, making you do the flip maneuver all over again. There seems to be a cover mechanic in the game too, but I'll be honest, I don't think I ever used this on purpose. Not nearly as useful or impressive as the cover mechanic seen in Windback, an N64 game that came out around the same time. Besides pressing some switches and turning the odd valve wheel, usually for no reason at all, you might find yourself pressing circle to climb down ladders. Climbing up is simple, walking at them will cause your character to start ascending. However, because the levels are so vertical and fall damage is a thing, you may be forced to baby your character to the very edge and hope you're close enough for the circle button to do the thing you want, otherwise... <sighs> I hate this game. Climbing the ladders you stumble on is something you'll be doing quite often, as the verticality of the level design isn't optional by any means. So often, the path to get to the dot on your GPS requires a rather nonsensical leap of logic. Oh, let's climb a ladder a couple blocks away, do some platforming on the roofs, or maybe slide down a rope and there we go, secret entrance. If the game wasn't mostly bad, this could have been a genuine positive. There were times where I had fun with it, sleuthing around town, finding out how deep the rabbit hole of crazy carpentry went in this city. Unexpected mandatory platforming to reach your destination, running a few blocks away to a different building and crossing some bridges to get to the rooftop the GPS wants you in, driving a van under the high up ladder, or even figuring out how to access the seemingly inaccessible ropes to slide on, the correct ones being the only way to reach certain building summits. There's even some stat boost secrets tucked away in every mission, so poking around in this urban jungle has its own benefits. Very strange to me, though, with all the necessary jumps and ascension, that climbing fences is such a hassle. Jumping at them is almost a surefire way to fall back down for some reason. There's no special animation, you just glitch back down. It actually got me killed one time. Also, some of the required ropes that you'll have to slide down are needless- <sighs> I love burping in the middle of a take. Also, some of the required ropes that you'll need to slide down are needlessly dangerous. Why couldn't they just lower this one so a simple jump would suffice? Instead, they make you take a leap of faith, knowing that if you missed it, or this rope wasn't real, since who knows with this game, you'd surely die and have to start over. Anyway, beyond all that, the concrete and steel playground of the roofs, ladders, and ledges was kind of enjoyable to traverse. I wouldn't mind having to explore and figure some of this stuff out myself. The maze-like structure made me view the environment in a different light, but the failure states completely kill the mood. 
I have no problem with long missions, but when one bad enemy encounter, thanks to camera or controller issues, results in getting absolutely decimated, it feels pretty shitty to have to redo the whole level again, jumping through all of the hoops and strange level design quirks another time. Punishing checkpoint systems aren't necessarily bad, but coupled with clunky controls, a poor camera, and mediocre gameplay, it just makes everything so tedious. It wouldn't feel so bad if you could keep healing items on you, but you can't, and your total health isn't all that great in the first place. Trying to find the pre-existing health packs in the level might mean wandering around for even longer, making the trepidatious expedition even more monotonous and less exciting. Worse though, many failure states have nothing to do with your health. I've already talked about the hostage green shirt disaster, but there are quite a few that are timed, some with an invisible timer. In one of the missions with an on-screen countdown, you earn more seconds on the clock for every gang group you take down. I literally failed it while killing the enemies that would have earned me more time. Absolutely disgusting. You may also accidentally or mistakenly kill the guy you were supposed to arrest, which is extra heartbreaking since those objectives are usually near the end of the missions. The best example of the failure states undermining the fun in Urban Chaos is the snow level. This is the only time you're not in the city, and it's a snowy, mountainous landscape. You have to plant explosives to destroy three missiles. I got really excited at the start of this level, it reminded me of Metal Gear Solid for some reason. There are landmines all around, and enemies don't come mindlessly running towards you like usual, they're in bunches or isolated to themselves. Except, not only is there an obvious timer presiding over the whole thing, once you're spotted near the missiles, the green shirt suspender bozos run to the launch codes and immediately set the missiles off. Mission fail, restart. It feels like the moment they touch the rectangle box thing that acts as the launch switch, it's done. No grace period whatsoever. Those guys are clearly the top priority, but this level in particular doesn't start you with much firepower, so you're forced to accumulate some guns and ammo by tackling the stragglers first. This, of course, eats up your time, and because you don't know where the runner will be in each batch of enemies near the missiles, you'll likely have to go through this whole process over and over to start learning the route to take and how to approach. Again, just think of all the issues I've talked about already. Aiming your gun is unreliable, camera issues are rampant, the GPS, radar, and targeting systems don't mesh well together, along with the audio cues and poor draw distance, and it's incredibly easy to die with your low health pool and lack of healing items. All of that, plus you're rushed, there are men in black enemies in certain locations, and suspender bozos that run to the launch missiles at a moment's notice. On paper, this is a fun escape from the usual urban chaos levels, but in practice, it long overstayed its welcome simply because the game is all too eager to send you back to the start over a small mistake. Because the latter half of the game's levels are such a time sink, I'd often start them at a snail's pace, praying I didn't have to restart. Rescuing Gordansky is one of the last missions in the game, and I remember all too clearly how simultaneously boring and terrifying it was to inch my way forward, keeping my ear out for any audio cue that signaled an enemy might approach my radar. Once I realized I was finally back at the start, where the police safe zone was, I sprinted to the finish line with a huge sigh of relief. Yay, I only had to redo that mission twice! As much as I disliked the level structure, it was nice that the objectives had a bit of variety to them. Sure, you still murder wildcats and men in black in almost all of them, but the window dressing of it all was fun. I think there's a few too many missions in the basic big city, and the timed objectives can fuck off entirely, but there were some standouts that, at least in retrospect, helped the game from getting stale. Not that it's good, but you get it. Now and then you'll get a tag-along partner following you to help out, and even though I think they stick too close and block some of your view, and are sometimes dumb as rocks, not running away from a gang with shotguns, having a pal for tag-teaming is a decent change of pace. The limitations of Roper, such as his lack of arresting power and no sprint, aren't amazing or anything, but carrying bodies back to safe points is different and kind of fun. More specifically, some levels have you planting explosives, infiltrating hideouts, arresting certain criminals, escorting important NPCs, driving cars back to a destination, defeating the demon Balrog... What the fuck? Uh, there's also a mission where you have to find a bunch of clues to solve a crime. This is where the supernatural elements of the game make their first appearance, as the suit-wearing crazy dudes get introduced here. I literally couldn't believe what I was seeing after I managed to kill one. His corpse raises, electricity flies everywhere, 
and if you're close enough, you take damage and possibly even die. It's bonkers, but the sad part is, the sound design completely fails the game in this instance too. This extraterrestrial display surely should be paired with something unique, right? Instead, it's a slight POW sound effect and a normal voiceover of a guy getting punched. Just embarrassing, to be honest. I know I threw the Balrog at you out of nowhere earlier, but genuinely, that's how it came across in the game. No buildup whatsoever, one mission it's mostly normal, the next, the sky is red, everyone is dead, and there's a flaming demon here to cause trouble. You need to open up the gates before the fight, then lure him through the alley, blowing up oil barrels and mines when he walks near them. Normal gunfire doesn't do much, he hurts a lot, even when just standing near him, and there's no ammo around, just grenades, which kind of suck to use if I'm being blunt. It's not a bad encounter, actually, one of the only times it felt like I was in the midst of a boss fight. This is the part where I talk about the story, and at first blush, it seems like there should be a lot to talk about, but the game doesn't really provide a lot of answers. There's a couple of FMV cutscenes, but it seems like there should be way more given how off the rails this game gets. There clearly was a lot of effort put into the opening attract video that starts up when turning the game on. It sets the stage with an ominous and, honestly, pretty establishing shot of the city near the new millennium. Roper and Darcy go chasing some thugs, they catch them. Then, the men in black slowly make their way over all menacingly, one of them even walks over the cop car nonchalantly before blasting a helpless dude a thousand times with their little chain gun thing. Darcy and Roper escape. The narrator guy, or maybe Bane, I don't know, says, This will be the final reckoning, and then the title card greets us. If that confused you, guess what? The main game isn't much different. The brunt of the story is told through the briefings before missions and in some cutscenes, and the vast majority of the mission briefings are from the police chief, which mostly center around the Wildcats, a terrible name for a supposedly dangerous crime gang. Roper, a mystery man that Darcy has never met before, starts giving her a lot of help out of the blue. He apparently knew her dad, I guess, and he's who we get the most information from about what's going on. We eventually will learn he knows more people in the police force than just Darcy, and it's hinted he could be a special agent of some kind. Anyway, Roper mentions that Bane, the new mayoral candidate, took a local gang under his wing, the Wildcats of course, which is how they've gotten more powerful. What's so strange though, is Roper name drops Bane basically right away, but for the next quarter of the game, not only does Darcy ignore the conspiracy she heard from Roper, Roper himself is vague with his information, almost afraid to talk about Bane again. His non-police status, mysterious demeanor, and wishy-washy language makes me understand why Darcy isn't taking what he says at face value initially, but it starts to get silly a few missions later for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Gordansky, the local reporter, seems to know more about what's going on than Darcy and won't explain much in the beginning since she isn't a fan of the police in Union City because they're mostly awful. I agree with her, by the way. Not only do they indiscriminately kill suspects without giving them a fair trial, even in the mission briefings, it's said they rough up suspects until they talk, which is basically torture. I mean, if you hurt enough civilians during missions, the police chief will reprimand you, so that's good at least. I got one warning near the start, which made me stop being so reckless, and another, a different warning near the end. Which is very odd, since I don't think I harmed any civilians that level, but I don't know. No idea what happens if you keep pushing the boundaries, but I'm not checking. I don't want to play this game anymore. I did read through the manual afterwards, and assuming it can be trusted, after five of them, you fail the mission and have to start over? Given that you get the warnings after the level is over, I don't understand how that would work, but even still, this is barely a slap on the wrist as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the wording about the fake investigations department definitely sounds scarier than a level restart, but I don't know. If it does restart your whole save file, that's hilarious, but I highly doubt it. Anyway, this interaction with Gordansky is what I was referencing earlier. Darcy being so clueless and naive wouldn't be terrible, since she is a rookie after all, but Gordansky basically confirms what Roper already told her, yet Darcy refutes the claim that the Wildcats are anything more than common street scum. Why would they capture a reporter if that was the case? Of course, Darcy doesn't talk to Roper about this update next time she sees him, he just speaks in more vague riddles. 
He says the Wildcats are just the tip, that this is more insane than she might believe. Oh baby, how juicy. Darcy asks for evidence, but Roper says he needs her to uncover it for him, since she has a badge. Alright then. Moving on for now, at one point there's betrayal. A police sergeant was apparently working for the Wildcats, informing them of our police busts. I don't know who Sergeant Smith is, and his death was so anticlimactic, I'm overall unsure of what the purpose of this was. After this, there are some small hints about police collusion with Bane, or with the Wildcats at the very least, so maybe this was part of that. Anyway, after a few more missions with Roper not saying anything substantial, we finally get our first FMV cutscene that isn't the Attract video. It's Bane, most likely, saying the Wildcats are incompetent, and he then introduces his new henchmen, the Men in Black. Yep, that's it. No other info, not even what they're called. It does set the tone for the next mission pretty well, as does the foreboding camera pan to the Men in Black on the roof, watching from above. It said there was barely a body left for us to find. The victim in question for this mission was filled with hundreds of bullet holes. The police guy says there's no way it was done by local gang members, that it more resembled the work of the military. It's interesting that they point out a few times that nobody saw a thing. The suit-wearing enemies do have an incredibly fast mini chain gun, which is what that could be further hinting at, or maybe the fact that nobody saw anything, and they could be military forces, Maybe these guys are the Men in Black and used their little memory eraser thing on any witnesses. I kid, but only a little. The resemblance is uncanny. We kill someone named Braddock, which triggers a Man in Black to tell someone else who we don't see, maybe Bane, that their servant is dead. I don't know if that's necessarily imperative to know, but it's a thing that happened, and not a lot happens, so there you go. Darcy tells Dispatch that the Men in Black trigger an explosive device on death. Not sure if she saw them hovering in midair, but whatever. These guys definitely give the impression that they're not human entirely, but nothing in the game directly talks about it. Darcy gets captured for literally no reason, no explanation, nothing led to it whatsoever, and as Roper, we have to rescue her. The missions feel so disconnected, it's kind of wild. Not only that, the next one has an even stranger quirk to it. The mission briefings are all clearly voiced by the police chief that talks to you in the levels, so it's already a bit odd that he repeats himself, essentially, when each mission begins. He'll do the whole script reading, then the objectives, then when you load in, he'll say it in a different, but more natural way. Well, for Transmission Terminated, the one with the horrible hostage kerfuffle I talked about earlier, it makes even less sense. Gordansky seems to have informed the police that Bane is in charge, confirming that she did know early on about the connection, that Roper was correct with his information, and Darcy is a silly and stubborn lady. Apparently Bane has subliminal messaging advanced technology or whatever that he's planning on using in his broadcast to the city tonight. To distract the police, he's also gathered up a few hostages in the metalworks factory. Our objectives are to destroy the TV transmitter and rescue the hostages. The police chief says this himself. Destroy TV transmitter. Rescue hostages in factory. Then, once we load into the mission, he tells Darcy to save the hostages, but Darcy, under her breath, says she'll also destroy the TV transmitter before Bane broadcasts, but she won't tell the police chief that. You are back up. Go to it. Sure, chief. I'm also gonna blow that TV transmitter before Bane broadcasts, but I ain't telling you that. Damn. What is happening? This, to me, came across like she thought the police chief was working with the Wildcats and Bane. After all, there were already many hints leading us to believe there are corrupt officers helping the Wildcats and Bane with all of this. I'm probably wrong though, since in the next mission's briefing, Darcy trusts and goes along with the police chief like normal. The way I see it, if this inconsistency was intentional anyway, then the designers were trying to convey one of two things. Either Darcy simply wasn't assigned to the task, and she's taking it upon herself to get it done, which would align with her no-nonsense and strong-willed character, or between the briefing and the start of the mission, plans had changed, and every police officer was being pulled to help with the hostages. Which do you think it is? Well, it doesn't matter what you think, because the police chief tells Darcy to go take out the transmitter after the hostages are saved. <laughs> What the fuck, man? What the fuck? This game is ridiculous. Also gonna blow that TV transmitter before Bane broadcasts, but I ain't telling you that. Now take out that transmitter. 
After this, we hear that Bane has retreated to his estate, and Darcy and Roper go in and arrest him. Kinda wild how quick it was to say that, whereas this mission took me two hours of failed attempts. In all honesty, there is something kind of interesting that takes place in the middle of this level. When Darcy meets Bane, he says he's known her and Roper for a thousand years. I'm... sorry? It's time I know you, and the old man Roper. I've Ray. known you both for almost a thousand years. And that's it. Play as Roper and don't expand on that wild sentence. When they meet up when Roper saves her, Darcy doesn't mention it either. Instead, she says her and Roper are all that's left of the police force. Not sure if she means in this mission or overall, but I'm sorry, what? And she overheard the Wildcats talking about missiles being aimed at the city. I mean, sure, but really, nothing else on that 1,000 years part? After we arrest Bane, there's no fanfare or anything, it's just total silence. You're under arrest. Free! From here on out, the police chief gets replaced in the mission briefings with Roper. Uh, he's our new boss, I guess. But the police chief still talks to you when the missions start? So weird. This game is so fucking weird, man. Darcy has to retrieve a file. Once she does, Roper figures out there are missiles being pointed at Union City, which is the snow level I talked about earlier. In this mission briefing, we learn the names of the men in black. The Fallen. Yep, Roper just says it in a mission briefing out of the blue. It's not even a revelation unto itself. He brings it up so matter-of-fact. Wildcats and Bane's personal bodyguards. The Fallen. Don't take any chances with these assholes, Darcy. Okay, Roper, got it. Thanks, game. Awesome how underwhelming it was to learn more about them. We destroy the missiles, and for some reason, Gordansky is captured again, and we have to rescue her again. Now, the Fallen is being used freely as a name for a cult? The Fallen cult has overrun this district, and all civilians have fled the area. Weren't they just bodyguards in the last mission? Now they're a cult, I guess. This mission is such a waste of time, honestly. You'd think we'd at least get some more information from Gordansky about what's going on to fill us in through gameplay instead of mission briefings, but no, escort her like normal, and she says nothing. The very next mission is the Balrog one. I'll let this briefing play out and we can talk about it after. Bane has finally revealed himself as an ancient warlock to his lower wildcat minions. Those psychos are even more fanatically loyal to him now. Just what kind of power has he got over them? Our contact said that as a way of proving his strength and overwhelming the UCPD, Bane is going to call on ancient powers to materialize themselves in Union City. All we know for sure now is that we've got explosions ripping through the west area of UC. Get down there and find out what the hell is going on. Attend incident. So, hilariously stiff voice acting aside, I'm sorry, Bane has revealed himself as an ancient warlock to his minions? Maybe I'm just a fucking idiot, but shouldn't he be in jail? What's going on? Seriously now, we arrested him like four missions ago, and the briefings never said anything about him escaping. Instead, they talk of him like he was never even arrested. Also, yeah, he's a warlock now. Absolutely bizarre that this is the way the game chooses to deliver this piece of information. They had him saying, I've known you for 1,000 years earlier, and dropped it, and instead elected to randomly convey a bombshell to us in the middle of a boring mission briefing from Roper. Even the police chief could have sold this better. Just take his reaction to seeing the Balrog, for example. Holy shit! What the hell is that? Stir, you better act real fast and take that thing down! Does it make sense that the police chief is our go-to guy in missions while Roper is the briefing voiceover? No, but that's besides the point. The chief knows how to sell a situation. <sighs> this game sucks. Why am I talking about this so in-depth? The final mission, Roper does another badly delivered promo talking about what's going on. Now Bane is on a rooftop attempting to perform a sacrifice to fulfill the prophecy. Apparently the Wildcats are all wiped out, so hey, that's a nice thing, I guess. Roper is very dramatic and says this is the end either way. We then get the second FMV cutscene for the game, and it shows Bane hovering and doing a ritual. I'll be honest, this level sucked so much, and I was so utterly tired of the game that I didn't finish it. I got to the end, don't get me wrong, but I died because I thought I was supposed to fight Bane. 
How stupid of me to think that this would be a boss fight, right? This game isn't talked about much, but there is a single Let's Play on it on YouTube, and I'll use their footage for this last cutscene. As Bane is doing his ritual, the roof caves in from the explosives you set, a shot of Darcy and Roper, and fade to black. Yep, that's it. That's the game. When I saw how underwhelming the end was, I was happy I didn't push through, torturing myself with that final level any longer than I already had. Seriously, the moving platforms and tiny walkways to jump to and from can fuck off. The controls for this game are so bad, and the checkpoint system so punishing, this is just rage bait material. That's the story, that's the game. Both are bad, and absolutely not worth experiencing anymore. Maybe when it first released, the gameplay, if you got used to the controls, offered a bit more depth than its contemporaries, and provided a decently spacious open world to explore during levels. However, even a couple years later, this game would already hold little value, as the few things it had going for it were easily outshined by almost every game in the next generation of consoles. I normally don't have a problem with going back to play and enjoy older games, I just did with MGS1 and Tenchu and loved both of them. However, Urban Chaos's controls are so difficult to work with, its camera a giant hassle, the targeting system overly restrictive and outright bad, its visuals ugly as sin at times, its sound design lackluster at best and haunting at worst, its story completely forgettable and pointless, and its gameplay mostly tedious and frustrating that I find it extremely difficult to recommend it to anyone, even the most die-hard fans of the classics. There was something there, something adjacent to fun, when gunning down bad guys and exploring parts of the world, but with so much garbage to sift through and irritation to look past, those fleeting moments of mediocrity aren't worth the struggle. All that said, I'd give it a 9 out of 10. Thanks for watching, and if you'd be so kind, like the video and subscribe to the channel, please and thank you. Join the Patreon if you want access to the videos a bit early, or if you otherwise would like to support this channel in a monetary fashion. The next video will likely be something more than a handful of people will enjoy, so look forward to that. Now take out that transmitter.